I'm very privileged to be here. There is so much to talk about and uh, so little time. Um, this period in human history, I think, is unprecedented. Uh, how's that for starting a sermon? <laughs> I think right now we're living in a time that's unlike any other. God has given us an opportunity to reach people unlike any other time. He's placed you specifically here now for a purpose. Okay, you are not an accident. You are not living in 2016 in Toronto for no reason. And we don't have too much time to talk about this, so let's pray and let's get right to it. Heavenly Father, how much your heart must break seeing what we're doing to each other. Throughout the world, God, we just keep killing one another. We keep destroying one another. We keep fighting. And if, if we don't destroy others, we destroy ourselves through addictions. We destroy ourselves through fear, through anxiety. God, through chasing after greed and, and personal dreams, Lord, when we could be living like you lived, God. And here in Canada, we have been given so many blessings. I mean, we're in this room with air conditioning, with great music, great people all around us. When, Lord, more than half of the world, three and a half billion people right now live on less than $3 a day. God, I pray that we wouldn't feel guilty, but also that we wouldn't take for granted the gifts that you've given us. May we pour it forward, Lord. May we live these lives for others, not for ourselves. And can we understand, Lord, in this moment, can you please be with us and help us understand how we can engage this world that's so actively involved in destroying itself. For your glory, Lord, we ask. Please meet us, please encounter us now. Speak to us individually, Lord. Everyone in this room, I pray you would speak specifically to them. If you'd like to speak through me, Lord, I would be honored to be a vessel broken though I am, but if you wanted to speak directly into people's hearts and bypass me for the next half hour, I would love that, Lord. We just pray you'd be present. We thank you that when we gather in your name there, you are also. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I normally close my eyes when I pray and I can walk off stages. Um, so I'm thankful this little lip is here. That's very good. Um, I was uh, raised in a Muslim family in the West. Um, my parents are from Pakistan. Uh, my mom is the daughter of a Muslim missionary. So she was, even though she's Pakistani, she was raised in Indonesia because that's where her father was preaching Islam in the jungles of Indonesia. My grandfather was a Muslim missionary as well, uh, preaching in Uganda. And he was also a physician, so he was healing in the name of Islam and preaching in Uganda. So I come from a line of Muslim missionaries on my mom's side. On my dad's side, um, my dad uh, chose to come to the United States in the 70s from Pakistan uh, because our sect of Islam was being persecuted by other sects. So it was a bit of a matter of religious freedom. He, tends, he actually landed the day that Elvis died. Why is that funny? Um, <laughs> he gets off the plane, he looks at a newspaper, the newspaper says, the king is dead. And my dad says, I could have sworn they had a democracy. That's, that's how they came from Pakistan, uh, just devoted to Islam, passionate uh, people about their family, their culture. My dad immediately joined the US Navy. For 24 years, he served the US Navy. Um, and for, for me growing up then, being an American was not opposed to being Muslim. Uh, it was a matter of being both at the same time. I was an American Muslim, both American and Muslim. I saw my dad go out to sea and defend our country regularly. Um, and so when I was taught that Islam is a religion of peace growing up, uh, I, I, I really believed it. I believed that this was what is Islam. It, it's a matter of bringing peace with Allah and also peace with others. Um, and so being a devout Muslim involved that component of patriotism. It also meant praying five times a day. We prayed the Salat regularly. During the five daily prayers, Muslims recite portions of the Quran. So that means having portions of the scripture memorized from a very young age. Uh, if you hear your father recite scripture every day during the prayers, you memorize it. So by the, by the time I was five years old, I had the last seven chapters of the Quran memorized. And my mom had taught me to recite the Arabic of the Quran, so I had the last, I had the whole Quran recited in Arabic by the age of five. Didn't even know how to read English yet, but because Arabic was the language of the Quran, my mom had taught me to recite the scriptures in Arabic. That's what it meant to be a devoted Muslim. For me, in my childhood growing up and everyone around me, that's what it looked like. 
when 9-11 happened, everything changed. Everything changed. Because all of a sudden, we felt really vulnerable too. The world has not been the same since then. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but uh, it, everything has changed since then. Um, and not only did it change for Americans at large, um, but it also changed for Muslims in particular in America. Uh, because we felt the same vulnerability everyone else felt, but at the same time, we had to defend our faith from people who started saying, well, how do you explain what these terrorists have done? How can you say Islam is a religion of peace given what they have just done? And so we had to try to reclaim the rhetoric. And one slogan that I remember memorizing, by the way, I, I memorized this slogan at the, church, at the, at the masjid in Vaughan here. My, uh, my family uh, would come twice a year up to uh, Toronto and we'd, uh, because we had some aunts who lived here. Uh, and we'd go to the masjid here, the mosque, and uh, we'd, we'd come and receive instruction and pray. And one of the things they taught us here was, um, when someone asks you, were the hijackers Muslim, you, your response should be that not only did they hijack planes that day, they also hijacked Islam. Our religion is a religion of peace. And so that's how we were responding to people. And we believed it, these were not lies because we truly believed what we were saying. But I had a specific friend who I had just encountered a few weeks earlier. I was 18 years old, I had just started college uh, in August of 2001. September 11th happened a few weeks into my, uh, into my adulthood, really. And uh, my, this friend turned out to be a Christian. And he started asking me questions. Now, one thing that I respected about him was that he actually believed his faith. Most Christians that I encountered were unwilling to explain why they believed what they believed. Uh, if I asked them questions, why do you believe the Bible, they'd have no response. If I said to them, where did Jesus claim to be God in the scriptures, they, would, they wouldn't know. God forbid if I asked them about the Trinity, <laughs> they have no clue. Uh, what is the Trinity? Well, it's God is three in one. Well, God's not a shampoo bottle. What does it mean for God to be three in one? Can you explain this to me? And no one could explain these things. But I finally ran into a friend who was able to start explaining to me why he believed what he believed, why he thought the Bible was reliable, why he believed Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. Turns out he had been an atheist growing up and so he had to actually wrestle with this himself when he became a Christian. So in the midst of me challenging him and asking him questions, which by the way, if you've encountered Muslims in the West, they tend to be very, very informed on how to challenge Christians in their faith. So I was not an anomaly. When I was challenging him in his faith, 9-11 happened. And then he started asking me questions. He said, Nabil, how can you say Islam's a religion of peace? And I'd give him the spiel. And then he'd say, yeah, Nabil, I get that. I get what you're saying, but what about those verses in the Quran that those terrorists are reciting? What about those teachings of Muhammad's life that they're referring to? And I would do whatever I could. I would, I would read uh, defenses that my teachers and my imams gave me, and I would ask the, my, the scholars around me, how do I respond to his questions? And I'd give him the responses. But as he was asking these questions, now I was also internally beginning to wonder as well, is what I have been taught, is what I have been received true? Or is there more to this story? So it turns out that there were many things in the Quran I hadn't been told. For example, um, when, when people challenged me as Islam a religion of peace, I would say, La ikraha fiddin, uh, Surah al-Baqarah, chapter two of the Quran, verse 256, says, La ikraha fiddin, there's no compulsion in religion. So of course Islam's a religion of peace, look what the Quran says, there's no compulsion in religion. Or I would quote Surah Al-Kafirun, Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun la'abadun uh, abadun. Say to the disbelievers, oh you who disbelieve, basically those of you who aren't Muslim, you can believe what you want to believe. I do not worship what you worship, you don't worship what I worship, but that's okay. We can, we can get along basically is what the chapter says. Peaceful message. Those were the verses I knew. What I didn't know were verses like chapter nine, verse five. Slay the infidel wherever you find them, lay siege to them and take them captive. That's in the Quran too. Verses like fight the Jews and Christians until they pay the ransom tax and feel humiliated. I didn't know about that verse either. I, I honestly didn't know about these verses because when Muslims read the Quran, most of them are not Arabs. The Quran is written in Arabic. Less than 20% of the Muslim world is Arab. And those who are Arab speakers speak Amiya, they speak colloquial forms of Arabic. They don't speak the classical Quranic Arabic. And so we didn't understand a, a lot of these texts unless our teachers told us about them. 
Uh, and so when I was confronted with these, I started studying and investigating for myself, what is the truth about Islam? What is the truth about Muhammad? Because ultimately, that's what it boils down to. If you're a Muslim, you're a follower of Muhammad. Yes, there's beliefs about the Quran and, and about Allah and all that, sure, but you're following Muhammad to get to those beliefs. When you're a Christian, you follow Jesus. So the life of Jesus and the life of Muhammad are very important in these conversations, especially when it comes to the Quran. There's so much I wish I could tell you, but basically here's what I began to realize, that there are plenty of peaceful verses in the Quran and in the traditions of Muhammad's life, and there are plenty of violent verses and stories, tons. How do you reconcile them? We in the West has been, had been taught that uh, the violent stuff should be seen as all defensive and, and coming under the lens of the peaceful stuff. The peaceful stuff is the stuff that prevails. But as I was challenging my Christian friend in his faith, he began to show me not 20th, 21st century books written about Muhammad, those were all very, very much uh, combed through and, and made palatable to Westerners. He started to say, Nabil, let's look at the sources of Muhammad's life. Let's look at the Quran itself and the Hadith and the Sita. Let's look at the original stuff, not what people are writing now, but the original stuff. And that's when I found that what I had been taught about Islam wasn't consistent with the sources. Turns out Muhammad had started uh, his, let's call it a prophetic career, in 610 AD. He dies in 632 AD, and in that time he goes from peaceful, starting off with the message of worshiping one God and helping widows and orphans and travelers, etc. takes that message and it becomes increasingly more violent until the time he dies. The first 13 years of Islam, no battles are fought, no, no wars, um, this was a peaceful time with peaceful messages, but he only had 115 followers or so during that time. In the last nine to 10 years of his life is when he had power, when he had a city under his control. And it was during that time that we see battles increasingly fought. In fact, at a rate of nine battles per year, 86 before he dies, in the last nine to 10 years. The Quran is not laid out chronologically. So the last major chapter of the Quran to have been composed is actually chapter nine. That's the last, follow me here. This is the last major chapter of the Quran. This chapter is called the chapter of disavowal, Surat al-Bara'ah. And what is it disavowing? It starts off by disavowing all treaties with polytheists, with Jews, with Christians. Ultimately we see it's disavowing all treaties. And it's basically, this is the chapter that says slave the infidel wherever you find them. These are the final orders of the Quran. Slay the infidel wherever you find them, lest each of them take them captive. The Jews and Christians, fight them until they pay you the jizya. Why? So that's chapter nine, verse 29. Chapter nine, verse 33, Islam has been made to prevail over every other religion. Fight the Jews and Christians because Islam has been made to prevail over every other religion. Now I'm seeing this as a Muslim and this is all shocking to me. I'm learning this and it's shocking to me because I didn't know this growing up. And then I get to chapter nine, verse 111 of the Quran, which says that Allah has saved you, that's the Christianese way of saying it, Allah has bought your persons and your property for this, that you might slay in battle and be slain. Allah has made you Muslim so you can slay in battle and be slain. That's what chapter nine, verse 111 says. Incidentally, it's the same verse that says if you die in jihad, you will go to heaven. The only guarantee given in the Quran of going to heaven. This was earth shattering for me. Uh, and by the way, this, uh, I was invited to speak here because of my book that just came out on this topic, Answering Jihad, after what happened in San Bernardino, after what happened in Paris, um, we, we have all these questions that people are asking and I'm not hearing good answers. I'm hearing very polarized answers. Answers which say, that Islam is a religion of peace and the terrorists have nothing to do with Islam, or on the other side, Islam's a violent religion and we can't trust any Muslims. Those are kind of the two responses I'm hearing. One's focused on compassion, the other one's focused on truth, but we as Christians have been called to focus on truth and compassion. The fact of the matter is, even though these are the things that are found in the Quran, these are the things that are found in the Hadith, we are called as Christians to see Muslims as people. Children made in the image of God, broken, apart from God, but still people who are image bearers of God. Are you with me? 
And so this is, this is what I was going through as a Muslim encountering this information. At the same time, my Christian friend was introducing me to good reasons to believe in Christianity. I had been taught growing up that the Bible was corrupted. He showed me that that's simply not true. In fact, if I used the arguments consistently and I said, you know, the Bible was corrupted, actually I was condemning the Quran far more so because the same arguments I was using on the Bible is actually much more applicable to the Quran, although I had no idea. When I was saying that Jesus never claimed to be God, I would point to the Gospel of John and I would say, well, John's Gospel was written 60 years after Jesus died. You can't trust John's Gospel. What about the other Gospels? Where do they say Jesus claimed to be God? Well, ultimately I found where in the other Gospels Jesus claimed to be God. It's pretty clear once you read it through the lens of the Old Testament. But I had denied the reliability of John's Gospel because it was written 60 years after Jesus, supposedly. I don't think it is, but that's what people said. You turn to Muhammad's life, the first biography written about Muhammad comes 140 years after he dies. How can I consistently deny the Christian message in light of the way the Islamic evidence works? And so this information was coming to me. I was beginning to realize what I had received was problematic both in terms of its history and in terms of its theology. And so at that point, I started praying fervently to God saying, God, can you reveal yourself to me? Can you show me the truth? And you have to understand, Muslims, generally speaking, don't believe Allah communes with us. Not generally speaking, that's, that's just what Islam teaches. Chapter 48, Surah Al-Anqabut says that it is not proper for Allah to reveal himself to you. He remains behind a veil. So what Muslims expect if they want to hear from God is a dream usually. And this is why I think God speaks to Muslims in dreams. Uh, around the world, especially um, Muslims who are praying to receive the truth. Um, Anecdotally, I've I've heard, and from my own experiences, that 70% of people who leave Islam and come to Christ uh, had a dream of some sort, because that's how they're expecting God to speak with them. Um, And it's not a misplaced expectation. My My dad received plenty of prophetic dreams when I was a kid. My mom received plenty of prophetic dreams when I was a kid. We, we often knew what was going to happen because of these dreams. I'm not here to speculate why we got those dreams, but that is just what happened. So I asked God to to guide me through visions and dreams, and ultimately God gave me a vision in three dreams, um, which showed me that Christianity uh, was the truth, that the gospel message was the true message. I wish I could go into the details, but we don't have time right now. So after doing all this studying first for years, it brought me to the altar of Christ and then, and then I started asking for dreams and visions and he gave me dreams and visions, placing me right in the middle of a biblical parable I'd never read. But you can't just convert. It's not, I mean, it's, it's a very Western concept to just do what you think is right. We're, most of the world is not that individualistic. You do what is right socially. You, you think of the ramifications it's gonna have for your family, for the people around you, what it looks like for your own reputation to do these things. If I were to become a Christian, that would mean that I was throwing my whole family under the bus. Not only am I gonna destroy my own reputation in the Islamic community with everyone around me that I know, but that also means that my mother, who's the daughter of a Muslim missionary, everything she has done in her life has been done partially to build her reputation within the Islamic community. If her only son becomes a Christian, that throws everything she's done into the trash. Does that make sense? Am I willing to not just do this to me, but to do this to my mom and to do this to my dad as the only son in our family? These are the issues I'm wrestling with and it's hurting and that's why I'm asking God for more dreams, more visions, asking him to give me more and more but at a certain point, enough's enough and the Lord stopped giving me more and so that's when I realized I had to do what I had to do but I couldn't quite do it. Um, Like I said, I met David my freshman year of college. By this point, I was in my my second year of grad school so this took years to get to this point and as I was driving to school one day, I just started bawling, I just started crying And I said, God, I know what I have to do, but I need time to mourn. I need time to mourn. And instead of going to school, actually, I turned back around and went back to my apartment because I was a total mess. And I sat down at my couch. I pulled out a Bible and a Quran, and I put them both in front of me. And I said, God, can you just comfort me? Can you just comfort me? And I opened up the Quran. Understand, when Muslims recite the Quran, they usually do so liturgically. They don't know what they're reciting for the most part, so this was 
the first time I went to the Quran for personal guidance, to exegete it for personal guidance, as I'm flipping through its pages, I realize there is not a single verse in the Quran designed to comfort a hurting man. Not one. Sure, there's plenty that say if you repent, Allah may forgive you, sure. But there's not a single one that says God loves you regardless. And so I put the Quran away, I said this doesn't apply to my life. I opened up the Bible, didn't know where to go. Every time I'd opened up the Bible before, it was to rip it apart apologetically. And, and this time I, I was actually turning for guidance and I said, well Christians read the New Testament, I'll, I'll flip to Matthew. So I opened up Matthew chapter one, saw a bunch of genealogies, so I skipped them. <laughs> I was a Muslim, I had an excuse. You guys have no excuse. So I turned the page. It didn't take me long to get to Matthew chapter five, which says blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Those were the exact words I had just spoken to God and it felt as if the page was electric. It felt as if the word of God had jump-started my heart. I actually like, couldn't let go of the Bible. I was, this is amazing. I read the next few verses and it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. And I'm thinking, I do hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm, I'm not righteous, I want to be but I'm not but God will bless me anyway? Why is that? Why will God bless me even if I'm a failure? And all of a sudden I encountered a God who loved me regardless, like my father loves me, so does God, in fact far more so. And this unconditional love was mind blowing to me. And I start reading the pages of scripture, encountering this God, and God's pretty awesome. This was a study Bible that my friend David had given me. I would, uh, out of exasperation, I'd say something like, God, how do I know you can even hear me when I pray? And I'd read the footnote, if you wanna know that God hears you when you pray, <laughs> turn to 1 John 5, sweet, boom, thanks. I start reading, and so I'm going back and forth within the scripture, and I finally get to Matthew chapter 10, and here's what I read in Matthew chapter 10. He who confesses me before the people of this world I will confess before my Father in heaven. And he who denies me before the people of this world, I will deny before my Father in heaven. You see, I, I had all the evidence, I had all the spiritual guidance through dreams and visions, I had emotional comfort as well through the scripture, but I hadn't confessed. You actually have to confess before the people of this world. And I said, God, this is Matthew chapter 10, 29 through following. I say, God, I, I would have to give up my family. If I confessed to you, I would have to give up my family. You know what the next verses say? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And I, I, I said, God, it's, it's not just my family, it's everything, it's my life, everything I know, everything I've worked for. If I became a Christian, I'd have to give it all up. You know what the next verse is say? He who does not pick up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. The gospel has been a call to die from the very beginning. Let me repeat that. The gospel has been a call to die from the very beginning. Pick up your cross and follow me was not Christianese when Jesus said it. And so at that moment, I bowed my knee. I prayed to receive the Lord. It sounded very Muslim, what I prayed. <laughs> no one had told me about a sinner's prayer. Um, but I prayed to receive the Lord. Intellectually, in that moment, I assented to the gospel. But it didn't really hit me until a few days later. When my mom was standing in front of me. And if you had met her before that day, you would have seen a woman who had light in her eyes. She just loved to receive people. She welcomed people into her home, fed them till they were, were far beyond full, uh, always gregarious, talkative. That was my mom. But it was like that day, I reached into her eyes and turned off that light. She's never been the same. And my father, who had been in the US Navy, I saw him kind of as my Superman, a man who stood strong and went out to defend our country. He said in that moment, Nabil, today I feel as if my backbone has been ripped out from inside me. And they walked out, that was all they said. And I, I uh, dropped to my knees I, and I started just 
crying. And in, this was hours of just crying and trying to pray and just flustered and saying ultimately, while I'm just bawling, I'm saying, God, why, God, why, God, why? And what I was trying to get out was, God, why didn't you kill me? Because I was thinking to myself, if you'd killed me, God, the moment I believed, I'd go to heaven, I'd be happy. They wouldn't know, they'd be happy. I'd be worshiping you, you'd be happy, we'd all be happy if you just killed me the moment I believed. And so I'm rocking back and forth saying, why didn't you kill me, why didn't you kill me? Stuff coming out of my face, saliva, tears, mucus, just like rocking back and forth, why didn't you kill me? And I don't know theologically where you stand, but I'm just here to testify to what happened in my life. While I'm saying, why didn't you kill me, why didn't you kill me, I heard audibly these words, because this is not about you. And when I heard that, I froze, just boom, froze, couldn't move. For 10 minutes I was stuck and when I finally could move, it felt as if the guy who had been crying say, why didn't you kill me with somebody else? It felt like that was somebody else. And I walked outside and I looked around and this is gonna sound cliche but this is true for me what happened, everything looked different. The sky looked different, the the trees looked at the parking lot looked different, everything looked different. And I saw somebody walking across the street. Very mundane thing to see. But for the first time in my life, I didn't just see somebody, it struck me that this was somebody God was willing to die for. Okay, that's very common for us when we say that as Christians. But can you imagine, from, from the perspective of a Muslim for just one moment, can you imagine the notion of God dying for someone? God who remains apart from this world as if behind a veil, that God who created this universe just by thinking it into existence, the God who is all powerful, the creator of time and space, entered into it and suffered at the hands of his own creation. How does this make any sense? And when he entered into it, he entered as a child born to two children. We have to remember Joseph and Mary were very young, born to two children who had been accused of an illegitimate relationship. Jesus bears the ignominy of being an illegitimate child. This is the God of the universe we're talking about. And then when he comes, he lives as a blue collar laborer. He could have come into the household of a king. No, he works with his hands in sweat and tears. And he ultimately gets 12 disciples in whom he invests his whole heart and they betray him, one of them with a kiss. Betray him to death and then he gets flogged. Have you ever read about the flogging process, what that's actually like? Cicero tells us that it was called the pre-death, that people were whipped such that their skin fell off their bodies in ribbons. People's abdominal walls were torn open, intestines fell out during the flogging process, our God going through this and then placed on a cross. You know, the cross was designed to be the most humiliating, the most painful way to die ever in human history. We had to invent a word to describe how painful it is. Excruciating. Excruc means from the cross. This Pain is what God decided to use. This death, he takes a look at all of human history and he says, that death, that execution is enough to show people what I want to show them. What was he trying to show us through all this? The depths of his love for us. If you were born in an illegitimate relationship, God understands and he loves you anyway. Enough to bear that with you. If you are trying to make ends meet, working hard, blue collar laborer, doesn't matter who you are, God loves you enough to take that burden upon himself. If the people you've invested yourself in said that they would love you till the day they died and then they left you in your moment of need, God's been through that. He loves you. If your body is broken and you're saying, God, why me? Why me, God? Jesus' body was broken on the cross. 
out of love for you. And why? Is this just a gesture? Is this just a, a pointless gesture or maybe a heartwarming gesture? No, we have to remember what Jesus says in John chapter 15, as I have loved you, so love one another. Okay, this is, where, this is what it all boils down to at this point. God loves us tremendously. He was willing to go through all this to show us what love is and then he charges us with loving one another with the same love. As I have loved you, so love one another. What does that mean? What does that look like? Romans chapter five, verse eight, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God is willing to die for us when we're in active rebellion against him. The people who crucified him, Jesus says what in the Gospel of Luke? Forgive them, they know not what they do. The very people driving nails through him. And then we, tend to skip over those verses in, in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, if you are hungry, uh, if your enemy is hungry, give them something to eat. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Your enemy, who is it you're supposed to love? Just other people who love you? No, read the end of Matthew 5. Even the pagans love those who love them. You are called to love those who do not love you so that you can be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is the teaching we have been given. What breaks my heart is that I see people responding to the refugee crisis. They see 4.6 million Syrian refugees coming from the West and the first question they ask, even Christians, is am I going to be okay? Yeah, (laughs) you're going to be fine. Take heart, I have overcome the world, says Jesus, John 16, 33. You're good. (laughs) Anyone who's unsaved, their needs are infinitely greater than yours, which is why you can lay down your life for them. You can follow Jesus. Jesus gave us the example of dying for our enemies, and then he says, follow me. Now, when we call ourselves Christians, what are we doing? We're taking God's name, Christ, and putting it on ourselves, Christian, little Christ. That's what it means. Now the Bible says very clearly, do not take the Lord's name in vain. That doesn't mean if you stub your toe, don't say, oh God. (laughs) That's not what it means. It means do not bear the name of God and not live like God. This is how Christ lived, this is how he calls us to live. This is God's plan for saving this world. For 2,000 years, we've had God's plan of saving the world, which is the grace he gives us, the love he gives us, we pour forth because there's nothing that can stop this grace unless we don't pour it forth. And then I wonder whether we received it to begin with. There's no way I think you can receive the gospel, receive this much forgiveness from God and not love others. There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. 1.6 billion. It's one out of every four people. Of them, 0.01% actively fight in the name of Islam. We are called by our God to receive these people. And I I loved that picture I saw of Justin Trudeau with open arms receiving Syrian refugees. I love Canada. You guys are so darn friendly. (laughs) Is there a risk? You better believe there's a risk. It's a small one, but it's there. Should that deter us as Christians? Absolutely not. We have eternity to worship God in bliss. We have eternity to live joyfully without pain. We have this short life, a blink of an eye, to preach Christ. My aunt uh, passed away two days ago. Right when I landed here, I found out that she passed away. She lives in Cambridge, lived in Cambridge. She's been in Cambridge since the 70s. She's been in our backyard here. I don't think anyone shared the gospel with her. She's Muslim. I wasn't planning on ending with this, um, but I had some time left, which never happens. (laughs) People are dying apart from God. We have been charged 
by God to preach his message. The great commission is to preach the message. For 14 centuries, we haven't reached the Muslim world. Up until a few years ago, we were sending one Christian missionary into the Muslim world per million Muslims. And the majority of them came back with less than 10 converts. So God is sending them here in droves. This is our opportunity. This is the unprecedented opportunity I was talking about to reach the world with the gospel because the world is coming here. And in the last 14 years, we have seen more conversions from Islam to Christianity than in the previous 14 centuries combined. You are part of a worldwide movement of the Holy Spirit, which for eternity we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about what we did here for eternity. Are you going to grab the Holy Spirit's hand, be led by him, and reach this world? Are you going to follow Jesus or are you going to carry his name in vain? This is the task we've been given. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we don't have to be afraid. Even in the face of jihad, which is very real, which is grounded in the pages of the Quran and the Hadith, Lord, we thank you that the vast majority of Muslims are peaceful anyway. But those who are violent, Lord, we do not have to fear. Please equip us to love, even in the face of death, even if we have to lay down our own lives, Lord. Let's let others worry, but let us, God, follow you. May we live lives worthy of the calling we've received. May we love as you have loved. May we heal this broken world with your gospel. We need you, God, for this. We desperately need you, Lord. Keep our knees on the ground, keep our eyes on you. Humble us, Lord. Take our eyes off of these petty things that will take care of themselves anyway. Let us seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, God. We need you for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.